John, thank you very much for giving us your time. Pleasure. Uh, you work in a leadership team. You've worked in a leadership team for a long time, but now you lead that team. Mm. Just tell us something about teamwork. Mm. And then as the sort of the leader of the whole team, mm. how, how, what are the important things going forward mm. for you to lead that team well? What are the key things you're trying to develop? Well, I think for me, and this might be partly just the style of leadership that, that, that I have and, and the way that I look to lead, is to try and create an environment where other people can flourish and be uh, in an environment where they can be serving God's people well and mm. being equipped to serve God's people well mm. and actually doing that for other people too. So I think it's important that in any team, you know what your place is and you know your, your role, not mm. just your formal role and responsibilities in your job description, but, mm. but what you bring to a team as mm. well, uh, and perhaps what you don't, and therefore what, what other people do. Mm. So having a good understanding of yourself and your own contribution to a team and a growing understanding of that as we mm. grow, as we develop, and having a growing understanding of what other people and other personality types and other styles of leadership and other styles of doing things, mm. um, which probably will be different for your own, from, from, from your own, mm. or should be, Mm. In, a, in a good and in a flourishing team. Uh, so I think that's been really key for me over the last few years uh, is, in, is growing in understanding that and then yeah. harnessing that and creating an environment where other leaders can flourish and really take things on. So I know Patrick Lencioni in his book, The Ideal Team Player, he talks about being humble, not about my ego. Mm. He talks about being hungry, working hard. But the key one that you just put your finger on is what he calls smart. But he doesn't mean clever, he means emotionally intelligent. Mm. And I guess that's become more of an issue, isn't it? As a senior leader, you need to, to know and manage yourself well mm. and understand that others are different from you and manage them as they are. Mm. How have you grown in that? What have you what how, what's what resources have helped you grow in emotional intelligence? I think there are various things that you can do structurally to help both yourself and your your team. Mm. So I read a, a a number of books on helping you understand your, yourself as a personality type or as a as a, mm. as a, as a, as a leader leadership type, as it were, um, and understanding how others work as well. So there's a there's a book called Five Voices. I forget who the author is now, but yeah. I found it personally very useful for me in my leadership. Yes, uh, and understanding the dynamics of meetings and I, by naturally speaking, I'm quite an internal pro, internal processor. So I have to work quite hard to verbally process things, process things with, with people. I have to do that deliberately and choose to do that. But for me, just learning that other people are completely different to me in that. And when they're articulating ideas, they are just that. They're ideas there. They may, may just have thought of it like that mm. um, and therefore aren't committing to it necessarily. Or if it's an idea that, that, that I don't agree with, they're not necessarily even agreeing it with, with, with it themselves. Uh, so that's that's been important for me. Um, I always try and have some kind of leadership book on the go. Mm. Maybe written by a Christian, might not be written mm. by a Christian. Could just be insights on who we are as human beings, who we are uh, as leaders, and always having that attitude of trying to learn more about our own leadership, learn more about how others uh, lead mm. as well. Yeah, and we can. I think in the in in our life of the leadership team or life of a staff team, structure things in that really help us. So. I, I line manage um, most of the senior staff at Cornerstone. Yes. And so we will always have a diary in monthly meeting um, where we yes. have at least an hour together, just me and the, uh, that particular staff member, where we'll reflect on the month that's gone. Yes. Where we'll look to the month ahead. Yes. Uh, I'll ask if they, there are any decisions that they need from me. Uh, I'll also ask if there's anything that I could be doing differently to help, help them. And then we'll also reflect on well, I ask, what is God doing at the moment? So what's God doing in your, in your own life, mm. in your own family, in your own household? What's God doing in the ministries that you lead? What's God doing in, in our church as a whole? So it's not, it's not simply a business meeting. There's that um, broader pastoral discipleship yes. element to it. Yeah. Well. You've got a staff team. Many church leaders work as perhaps they're the only employed person. And they would say, well, I'd love to have a staff team. But actually, you recognise you need to grow uh, leaders all the way through the church. And how have you done that? And why is that important to see leadership, not just as a, a paid mm. role, but unpaid leaders as well? I think, firstly, any staff that we appoint aren't just there to just 
do tasks and to to do everything for mm. the church. They mm. are there to equip God's people for works of service. Yes. So, uh, and that's that verse actually from Ephesians is at the top of every uh, every job description at this mm. church. That's what we're there for to equip God's people for works of service. So staff, even staff members, employed people are there to mobilize yes. people into leadership, into into serving. So having that that culture is 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 really important. And then looking in, in different ways, be they, be they formal settings where you can give people leadership input, development, experience, having a go at something and then getting feedback. Um, being prepared to take a, a few, well, I suppose a few risks to, in, a, in a managed way. Mm. Uh, so providing, providing different environments where people can learn to lead in front of people that isn't necessarily a main Sunday service, but where mm. people can just get used to standing up in front of people and, and leading God's people. That might be a prayer meeting. That might be some other form of meeting within, within a ministry. Mm. But then as they grow in their, if they grow in their, their, their gifting and obviously in their character, they may be able to move on to uh, other forms of leadership, other forms of, um, uh, of, uh, of meeting or whatever it might be. And I think one of the key things is, is encouraging people when they're generally people know if something's not gone very well mm. and you can give feedback and, and help people improve. But just setting an environment where it's an encouraging environment to grow and to thrive in and that mm. that is verbally explicit and people are, are given further opportunities is yeah. really important. Yeah. Okay. And for uh, those aspiring to... Um, full-time Christian service in that sense of being paid by other Christians. Uh, mm. All of us are full-time Christian workers, whether we're paid by Christians or not, we're working for the Lord. But those beginning to make that journey into more formal church leadership, from your own experience, tell us some of the things that you found helpful mm. or the things that you found mm. unhelpful mm. as you as you went from, as it were, being a student and mm. you know years later now a senior pastor mm. of a large church. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that journey and what you yeah. learned on the way. So I studied politics at university in Nottingham for three mm. years, mm. and then I was a relay worker with the Christian unions for a year, followed by a year as an intern at Cornerstone. And then I worked in local, go in local government, still in Nottingham, uh, mm. for a number of years after that, and then uh, joined the, the full-time mm. staff of Cornerstone as a minister in training. And I think the, as I reflect back on, on those years, I was able to learn a lot formally, theologically through, I didn't go to residential Bible college, mm. but I was part of what's now called Crosslands uh, and was uh, trained theologically through that as well as here at Cornerstone. Mm. But I learned so much from other senior leaders that were around me mm. and were vastly more experienced than, than I was mm. and learn how to love people, lead people, uh, and also learned that you, you always need to be learning. You always mm. need to be a lifelong learner about the scriptures, about how to lead people, yes. about, uh, about the Lord, about everything. Um, so I think I, I, I also look back and see how I was given responsibility. Mm. Um, and sometimes I'm, when I look back, I'm surprised that yeah. I was given that responsibility that I was given. Yeah. But people did have a, a sufficient trust in me. And also mm. there was the safety net there should it all go wrong, mm. the world wouldn't end and the church mm. wouldn't fall apart. Yeah. So I was given real responsibility, but in a safe enough environment such that I couldn't cause too much damage. No, I often use this quip, your young men will dream dreams, and your old people will see visions, but it won't make any difference because the middle aged will run the <laughs> church as they always have done. Sometimes middle age, it, it becomes comfortable. It becomes a safe environment. We like it the way it is. We don't want anything to change. That's a sense of being risk averse. Mm. Leadership in church can end up not wanting to take any risks mm. just in case it all goes wrong. But you, you would say, actually, if you want to bring leaders on, you have to mm. take a risk. Mm. Tell a little bit more about people investing in you when you were young and inexperienced mm. and mm. what that did for you as you came forward into more formal leadership. My first experience of leadership in a Christian context would have been mm. at the Christian unions at university, very formative for me, mm. extremely formative. Uh, and then being a relay worker, being a, and then being an intern here and mm. being entrusted with, for example, leading some services, le having leadership responsibilities within the student ministry uh, then and being helped 
helped along with those, but not not micromanaged either. So mm. being given enough freedom to mm. to shape things in the way that that, that I wanted to, uh, and to own some of the the mistakes that that went with that inevitably, and to to learn from learn from those, and to learn how to respond when you make mistakes, uh, or or when you don't necessarily make mistakes, but people think you have, <laughs> or people disagree with what you've done, yeah. and learning how to, to lead and respond in those kind of situations. Yeah. Now, Peter, who is your senior mm. leader, has modelled generosity of spirit and great encouragement, but you must have also seen weaknesses in other leaders that have, in effect, snuffed out the growth of leadership from within a church. What What would you pick up as weaknesses that could almost squash young leaders coming through? What are kind of things that can really put young leaders off from those who are meant to be encouraging them forward? Leaders tend to be strong personalities of one kind or another and mm. tend to be used to, to wielding influence um, yes. within a room or within an, an organisation. Uh, and I think... Where, where those leaders don't invite contributions from a younger generation and where they don't bring people with them, I think that is sowing seeds of, uh, of difficulty and discouragement that, that might not bear fruit till, bear bad fruits till decades down the line yeah. perhaps. But there's a yeah. culture that's set that, uh, that, that doesn't invite engagement from um that might not be strictly necessary but the important thing is yeah. that, that next generation of leaders are seeing that they have a contribution to make yes. and are learning to think like a leader so they're not just learning to implement the decisions of others they are learning and hope and hopefully contributing as well but certainly learning how leaders need to think how leaders need to weigh up dif difficult decisions and then seek the lord um for uh, uh, for direction and for, for decisions. So in that sense, a senior leader needs to be committed to empowering others from a very early period, really. It's uh, yeah, not getting just their voices. But, but engaging and yeah, helping yeah. people to to see through some of the, the whether whatever the changes might be that a church needs to make, for example, mm. not just imposing or learning how to implement a particular change, but no. being involved earlier in the process mm. to see the kind of things that they're that that need that leaders need to think about mm. as as we lead leader change. For yeah, example. I I remember reading a senior leader saying the most important skill was the skill of good listening. Mm. And to be a good listener, you have to ask questions. Mm. So in that sense, you have to learn to shut up. Mm. <laughs> and uh, how do you now that you have got to lead quite a big church? Mm. Have you is that what one of the skills you've had to implement with your staff team? I think what we've what I try to try to do is ensure that there is an avenue for mm. for discussions that that we need to have, yes, or frustrations that might need to be shared. So some of those av uh, avenues could be um, supervision meetings that that each member of staff has with whoever is their line manager. There are different, uh, and uh, so that's individual things from a team staff team point of view. There are different meetings that we would have. Uh, during the course of a week that have particular focuses. So it's not just a generic staff meeting. Mm. Each meeting will have a clearly defined purpose and where there's an, an agenda, there'll be uh, a, a, a set agenda. And also that, that, that those particular meetings each have owners. Um, those owners, usually, it's not me, usually. Mm. Um, uh, but I think it's important that, that from a listening point of view, people are feel as though there's... All, always an opportunity for them to take whatever concern or encouragement they may have. There's an avenue for them to take to take that down so that frustrations don't get bottled up for ages and then spew out. Mm -hmm. uh, and also so that encouragements uh, are shared. And we see in the large church, there's a lot that's happened that the Lord's doing yes. that any one of us won't necessarily see. No. Uh, so I think there are things that you can do structurally, but also then building deliberately building in time when you're informally engaging with leaders either one-on-one -on -one mm. or uh, in a more informal em environment. Mm. I like that thought. I, I remember somebody said to me recently in a, in a growing environment, I'd rather, if you're going to say something to me, I'd rather a snowball every now and then than an mm. avalanche once a year. Yep. And uh, in that sense, that keeping those communication channels open, learning to be a good listener, 
learning to get young voices speaking in the room. Mm. No, that's really helpful. Any other tips for uh, leaders who haven't got the luxury of a staff team but do need to grow leaders all the way through their church? Mm. Any other tips that you you think you know it's really important? This is something you need to work at. There's place for strategy and vision and having an excellent strategy worked out for how you're going to train leaders. And Mm. there's uh, certainly a place for that. But there's also a place for just starting. Mm. So just start meeting up with a younger guy or a younger person and have a build a build a friendship with someone who you identify could be a a leader Mm. of some kind in Mm. the future. Mm. And uh, share life with them, read with them, pray with them, worship with them, and start building in things. Uh, yeah. Just start with someone. You don't have to have a full strategy worked out. No. That may or may not be brilliant. No. Um, but just start somewhere, and yeah. the strategy will, might come in time. No, that's great. I, I'm always struck by uh, the Apostle Paul at, at end of Acts 15, where the disappointment of not being able to work with Barnabas any longer uh, because of the disagreement over... John Mark, you'd think the Apostle Paul would go, I don't want to go anywhere near young leaders ever again. Mm. They've just broken up this wonderful yeah. friendship I had. But yeah. in fact, what you find straight away takes on Timothy. And yeah. as you look at that, you're thinking, as you look at Timothy's chronology, you're thinking, Timothy's probably late teens. Mm. I don't think he's much older than that. As if he's still a young man by the time Paul writes to the end of you know, 1 and 2 Timothy, probably Timothy's young. Mm. And as you say, he's, his strategy isn't that worked out because the, the very next thing, you know, Paul says, well, I want to go to Bithynia. And the Holy Spirit says, no. Yeah. You know, and then no, and eventually try, and Paul hadn't got the strategy of European evangelism worked out mm. when he picked up young Timothy. It was more just, I just want to encourage this young guy. Who knows where God can take him? And you would say, start somewhere and start with somebody. Start somewhere. And it could well happen, as it has done for me in the last year or two. You just have a sense of the Spirit leading you yes. or putting someone on your heart that you've got to know in your church or has come across your path somehow. Mm. I want you to minister into this young person's yeah. life for some, for some reason. You mm. may just get a sense of the Spirit leading you in that direction. It may actually not seem all that strategic, but you don't know what the Lord's doing and what the Lord's got planned no. far beyond yeah. uh, your own shores. I also I think the interesting thing is that we you said earlier very helpfully I'm not just looking for someone in my own mold. Mm. It could be very, very different for me. I, back at home, one of our most significant leaders hardly does anything up front at all, but he is irreplaceable in terms of his wisdom, his pastoral counsel, his experience of life. Uh, he helps with the most complex people issues we ever mm. come across. And I, I'm so grateful that God has grown him as a leader, mm. that it's not just looking for another preacher, teacher, mm. clone of the senior leader at all. Tell us about other kinds of leaders than just upfront preacher teacher leaders. We talked about, um, or when we talk about risk taking that we need to be, Mm. need to take as leaders. I personally, I'm not a, I'm not a very risk taking person. So I'm naturally quite a risk averse person. And I think that does translate into my uh, my my leadership. I think some of that is the way that God's wired me, mm. um, and some of that needs to be challenged as well. But I do have people uh, around me, both on the staff and the wider leadership, who are uh, who would embrace risk and embrace that that challenge that the Lord gives us from time mm. to time um, mm. more uh, more readily than I would. But it's if if everyone on the team was like me, yeah. we wouldn't get very far. No. Um, so developing an appreciation of the, the different the different things that people bring to a team, and and the the complications that can arise, you know, from from not everyone thinking exactly the same or in the same way all the time, mm. and embracing that and and stewarding that well, crucially because mm. it can go badly, uh, but it doesn't need to. Uh, so looking to I think the importance of looking to 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 develop leaders who aren't exactly in your own mould in one way or another. They mm. may never be at the front but they could still have a very important contribution to make mm. uh, in leadership in other spheres um, and in the and in the church and in the kingdom kingdom more widely and and valuing that and making sure that the church values and appreciates not just the the upfront leaders but the yes. leaders who lead and minister in other ways and make sure that that's articulated from the front yes. so um, verbally valuing honoring people that serve that would 
by a thousand deaths if they ever had to stand up in front yeah, of hundreds that's of people. Massive. So, John, tell me about how do you get everybody's voices heard, not just the senior leaders? How do you hear from the whole church in a way that feeds into your leadership discussions? Uh, one of the challenges of a growing church is obviously more people. Mm. It's hard to keep the communication channels mm. working well. How have you managed that? I think there's a very important part of that is uh, leading the, the, the wider leadership. So people that aren't, aren't necessarily elders or staff, but people who are leading have significant leadership responsibilities in children's ministry and young people's ministry and mm. some, lots of the other ministries that we have in our small groups uh, and so on. So keeping, keeping people in, the, in that level of leadership engaged and encouraged loved, yes. communicated with well and we, we don't always we don't always do that but when it does uh, happen I think people really appreciate that uh, and appreciate being brought in on the kind of things that the the senior leadership team are thinking about at the earliest possible stage yes so not right at the beginning obviously but so that things don't come across as just decisions that are imposed but mm. people are brought into the thinking and understand some of the the nuances, some of the, the pros and the cons of any particular route that you might be take be taking or thinking about taking. Um, I read a, a book recently called by a guy called James Rebanks, I think is how you pronounce the name. Not a Christian as far as I'm aware, but is he a shepherd in the Lake District? And his book is called A Pastor's uh, Pastor's Life, uh, The Shepherd's Life, mm. uh, The Shepherd's Life, and it's a fascinating insight on the role of a shepherd. And at yes. one point in that book, he says, sometimes you will just see shepherds standing at a gate and watching, looking. It looks like they're not doing anything. But actually a really important part of the shepherd's job is watching, looking at the sheep that he is responsible for, mm -hmm. observing, thinking. And I think that's, that's a, a part of our pastoral ministry, our shepherding ministry that we often don't invest in well enough or talk about enough. Mm. But just looking and and listening mm. informally, um, being being approachable, I think yeah. is really important for, yeah. for for leaders, perhaps especially senior leaders, and structuring in times or places or opportunities you can, people can have for that. You don't need to advertise it like that, but you know that you are there mm. with that kind of posture. So uh, being an approachable senior leader, but also having an an approach. A leadership team that is approachable and doesn't come across as defensive or protective. Mm. Now, obviously, not everyone is going to agree 100% about everything by any means. Um, but as you seek to bring people on a journey with you, uh, mm. I think it's important that the, the shepherds or the shepherds don't get too far ahead of the flocks. And that will take time. I think that that does. You have to build in time for uh, to, to bring people with you in decisions. Mm. This whole area of people now glad that you're your senior leader, you've got a team. What are your biggest challenges in running a team? So many men in senior leadership have had very little training in mm. running a staff. Mm. Uh, they may have not been in the workplace like you've been. They, they feel like, I know what I'm doing when I'm preaching. I know what I'm doing when I'm pastoring someone through them, but I have not much clue in running a staff. Tell mm. us. Uh, key lessons you've learnt and where people might be able to go to get help. Yep. I, I've learnt most of what uh, the way the way that I lead our staff team. I've learnt that mostly from more exp more experienced people elsewhere. Yes. Um, so I've looked for conferences that I can go on or places that I can visit or people that like churches that I can visit. Mm. Uh, sought to have leadership in for, in, input from from a variety of sources. Uh, I've appreciated a number of uh, a number of different books, a number of different inputs that I've that I've had, um, and I think recognizing that you've always got something to learn and mm. you've always got something to that you can implement, and it might mm. just be one thing that you mm. that you that you pick up from someone else who might be a very different leader from you and structure things or be a, just at a very different season from you, mm. uh, but you might learn one thing that you then uh, choose to choose to implement, um, and. Also ask ask the people that you lead because they will have a pretty good idea yeah. what they would like to see. Yeah. So ask them. Good. John, thank you so much. We really appreciate you giving us your time and wisdom this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.